my internet handle is GCS Flow. And this is look here. Look at this thing that I want to review and hear what I have to say about it. So look here at me reviewing stuff. Spoiler warning. Blanket spoiler warning. I'll try my best not to spoil anything, but seeing as this is a review blog, spoilers will be made here and there. You have been warned. Extra warning, I will be discussing a graphic novel that is LGBTQ centered. If you're someone uncomfortable with that, first of all, why? Secondly, skip this video. So this is the second ever video that I'm making for my review vlog look here. And for the first one, I received some fairly good um, constructive criticism as to how I should make my second one. And one of them is that I should chop this up so that people can follow where in the review I am at currently. So I've decided to name the parts of my review as such. So for the first part, I am calling it the skin. This is the part where I'll be introducing the thing that I'm reviewing. Discuss the physical dimensions if there are any and talk about the creator or creators. Mention any accolades or awards it received and Talk about how much it retails so that if ever you are moved to buy this after viewing this, you'll know how much you have to save or how much to shell out. So for today, I've chosen to talk about this graphic novel. Look how pretty it is. It is a young adult graphic novel called Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. It is written by Mariko Tamaki, New York Times best-selling author, and illustrated by Rosemary Valero O'Connell. I've got some stuff up top, so I won't be wasting my time flipping through the pages trying to look for the page that I want to show you. So who are these people? Mariko Tamaki is an award-winning Canadian illustrator and author, best known for her graphic novels, one of which is This One Summer, a graphic novel that I have read before and have really enjoyed reading. I think she wrote it with her sister, I'm not too sure. Well, Rosemary Valero O'Connell is an illustrator and cartoonist best known for her works for, for DC Comics and Boom Studios. Together, they made this lesbian teen romance, as Wikipedia puts it, it is a graphic novel that received great reviews and great acclaim when it was published just last May, 2019. And it was published by First Second Books, a pretty good publishing house for indie type comics or graphic novels. So the book itself is pretty hefty. It's 289 pages of story with extras. It has extra pages at the end uh, showing character design, and some sketches. 289 pages of pure story, no, no fillers or whatever. It's printed on matte paper of a good size thickness, which I do appreciate. And it's printed mostly in black and white with splashes or accents of pink, like so. More on that when we get to another section of the review. It is about the standard height of a paperback novel. So see, for example, this one, Patron Saints of Nothing. They're basically the same height, but, but this one is a little wider. So it features a gorgeous cover. Look at it. Look at it. The spine is eye-catching, as you can see, our little protagonist over here. And it features a gorgeous cover. Just look at it. So beautiful. And it has an inside flap, inside flap where you can read the synopsis to give space to all of the praise that's written in the back because there's a lot of it. So let me read some of the praise that you can see in the back. Okay, I'll read one from Jean Luen Yang, author of American Born Chinese, a really good book. Shout out to that book. 
it's you don't have to be an American born Chinese to appreciate it. Anyway, Jing Luen Yang says, Marigot Tamaki and Rosemary Valero O'Connell expertly captures the awkwardness, tragedy, and hope of figuring it out, figuring out love. And then Rainbow Rowell, number one New York Times bestselling author of Eleanor and Park and Carry On. What what? She says, beautiful embracing, Tamaki and Valero O'Connell captures Freddie on the cusp of adulthood and in the throes of perpetual heartache. Good God, I wanted to break up with Laura D. Same. And then Molly Knox Ostertag, author of The Witch Boy, writes, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me is a stunningly beautiful book, it is, and a breath of fresh air in the canon of young adult LGBTQ literature in that it doesn't focus on homophobia, coming out, or repression, but instead follows a twisting and utterly relatable teen love story. In 2019, it has won a bunch of awards, which I will just post here because there's a lot of them. It also ended up in a lot of year-enders best lists of books. I will admit that this is one of the books that I judged by the cover. Because again, look at this cover. It looks gorgeous. The color palette is right up my alley. I love the I always love some greens and reds. And uh, the illustration is pretty and manga-esque. It's kind of like a manga style, which I like. And the title itself is very intriguing. It retails for $17.99 or 989 pesos, and I bought it at Fully Booked. So, on to the meat. Well, what is the meat? This is the section of the review where I sink my teeth into the meat of the story itself. Let me read the plot synopsis on the inside flap. Love hurts, it says. All Freddie Riley wants is for Laura Dean to stop breaking up with her. The day they got together was the best one of Freddie's life, but nothing's made sense since. Laura Dean is popular, funny, and so cute. But she can be really thoughtless, even mean. Their on-again, off-again relationship has Freddie's head spinning. And on Freddie's friends, and Freddie's friends can't understand why she keeps going back. When Freddie consults the services of a local mystic, the mysterious seek her, she isn't thrilled with the advice she receives, but something's got to give. Freddie's heart is breaking in slow motion, and she may be about to lose her very best friend as well as her last shred of self-respect. Fortunately for Freddie, there are new friends and the insight of advice columnist Anna Weiss to help her through being a teenager in love. Mariko Tamaki and Rosemary Ballet or Valero O'Connell brings to life a sweet and spirited tale of young love that asks us to consider what happens when we ditch the toxic relationships we crave to embrace the healthy ones we need. It also says here it's a junior library guild selection, which I think bodes very well. So, as far as title goes, I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Our protagonist is not Laura Dean. It's actually Freddie, Freddie Riley over here. She's an Asian American girl who's in love with the eponymous Laura Dean. Who is Laura Dean? Well, Laura Dean is just the coolest it girl in their high school who also happens to be a lesbian. They have broken up several times and each time they've got gotten back together again. So it is an unhealthy relationship. The book also features Freddie's friends, Buddy and Eric who are a gay couple, and her best friend, Dudo. Their stories are in the periphery of Freddie's high school romance, but they are nonetheless just as important. This story is set in a contemporary setting in Berkeley, California, and it features a variety of shapes and sizes for characters, and so it shows what a multicultural society currently is. While the centerpiece of the story is Freddie and Laura's romance, it being the catalyst for Freddie's inner monologue and her seeking out advice from one, a fortune teller, two, a potential crush, and three, an online advice columnist. 
the ongoing story surrounding it again is just as important especially in an lgbtq setting because guys this story is gay this story is all gay content even the background characters are gay a great example of this is the cafe where freddy works part-time it is run by an old school butch lesbian who names all their food items after famous lesbians so in page 159, oh, sorry, over here, if you can see. So that's 159 to the next page, 160. So there. They are debating whether or not to name a food item after an actress who allegedly came out. The owner is convinced that that wasn't a proper coming out, while one of the workers insists that it is a coming out. And should it matter? So this is just a bit of a throwaway dialogue for like in the background, but it is still just as important. In a 2019 interview, Mariko Tamaki, the author, stated that she didn't want the book to just be a story where the goal is just to find love and love is achieved. Then that is the end of the story. I wanted to look at, at love and relationships and then complicate them. When I was a younger person, especially a queer younger person, all I wanted were stories about relationships. All I wanted were love stories. And I guess it fully encapsulates the story that is presented here in the book. It is quintessentially LGBTQ, while showcasing a teenage romance between two girls without making a fuss about it being about two girls. The focus is not the usual suspects of LGBTQ stories, especially ones seen through the lens of heteronormativity. It is not about homophobia. It is not about coming out. It is not about repression although those themes are present and in the periphery and also just as important. But ultimately, it is a teen love story in all its heartbreaking glory. And it is utterly relatable to anyone who has ever been in the throes of teenage love. I like the conceit of using Freddie's letters to the advice columnist as a way of making that the interior monologue for Freddie all throughout the book. I think that this is a refreshing take on it and that it works. What doesn't work for me and actually made me a little confused was when the interior monologue was made to seem as if being spoken by the clutter and the things that surrounds Freddie. For example, one time it was the prints on a shower curtain Another time, it was the teddy bears and the toys, etc. It was kind of weird. It was, it's a little disruptive to the narrative, I think. But it's just few and in between. So you could like not really mind them that much. Still, that was a little out of place. However, this story and all the little stories surrounding it is such a satisfying read that I finished it in one sitting, especially when I committed to actually just reading it. I actually spoiled the book for myself. I read the ending first and then read the rest of it because I have anxiety and that's how I get through reading a book to each their own. It also has a very satisfying ending. And again, unlike the usual gay narratives in mainstream canon, it ends in a hopeful and joyous note. It does not bury your gaze. Hooray! So, now on to the bones. What is the bone section? It's not what you're thinking. The bone section is where I talk about the structure that's holding up the narrative. Mostly, I talk about the art because I like art. And in this one, oh boy. Do I like the art? I have mentioned that it is manga-esque or that it looks like a manga. So much so that I actually found this in the manga section of Fully Book. 
I have mentioned before that it's mostly black and white with accents and splashes of pink. And I like that conceit. The use of pink is not sparing. It is purposeful. What do I mean by that? When something important happens or when characters are experiencing heightened emotions, the color pink is used. This helps convey the emotions better aided by great drawing without having to spell it out in the text. For example, in this page, let me show you. Here. So you can see what is the first thing that your eye looks towards. It's the splash of pink, right? It's the kiss. So in this page, the pink was used to capture your attention and it's also used to show a heightened state of emotion for the two characters they're kissing so it's a heightened state of emotion the pink color focuses the attention to the kiss stealing your attention and derailing your train of thought just as it did the character freddy in the story of this page so as it is happening to you it is also happening to the character There's also a great use of irregular panels. There are traditional style grid panels. For example, traditional grid panel, here you go. As I have said before in my Manix Abrera review, this is a grid style panel. It is same, same size panels with same size gutters in a page. So she does use this. But I think the illustrator is more at home with inventive paneling, such as this two-page spread with panel inserts. This is a, as you can see, this is a two-page spread, and then within it, there are panels, like that. As well as this other panel style, panels within panels. So there is one big rectangular panel split into two, and inside, there's a circular panel also split into two. And it's showing the two different characters. They're kind of at odds at each other at this point. And then lastly, another... This, I think, is the best use of irregular panels for this comic book. It's a two-page spread. It's all irregular panels, one on top of each other and of varying sizes until eventually it dissolves into smaller and smaller panels until it becomes the background, the gutter, the whole of the gutter. Let's see, So you can see. So in this two-page diffused panel style, it lends well to illustrating the growing distance between Freddy and her friends without a word of text. Comics, you guys. Another thing that you'll notice is how lush the illustrations are. It's full of details and plants surrounding the characters in the background. For example, the very cover itself, as you can see, there's vegetation all around and then doodles in here, all so many details. And then in this page, which I think is another very well done page, showing the growing distance between the two friends all while being framed by lush vegetation so it is showing even though they're experiencing turbulence between their relationships life is still going on just like the vegetation around them it also means that it's spring just as it is the spring of our characters lives because they are young and they are in love. On to the cut! What is the cut? This is the part of the vlog where I give my final thoughts and ratings. So, for my final thought, there is only but one. I want to break up with Laura Dean. That's it. That's the final thought. No, I'm just kidding. Also, another final thought is that this is a very gorgeous book with a great story that is relatable to everyone while also being gay as hell.
I think that it is value for your money. So if you're thinking about or interested in expanding your reading materials, go ahead, give this one a try. As for the rating, I give this 10 10. 10 10 would read if I were a young lesbian desperately in love and seeking advice. Or if I was just thinking of reading a good young adult novel. So, thank you for watching up until this point. I am assuming that you're still watching, and if you're not, I have no way of knowing. Social media handles, follow me at jcsflow, that's the letters J-C-S-F-L-O, at Instagram and at Tumblr, if anyone is still on Tumblr. I am also part of an art collective called Team Olats, and we are at Am Team Olats on Facebook and at Team Olats on Instagram. Follow those accounts so you'll know where we will next be selling our merchandise, such as stickers, art prints, and posters. Finally, if you like this video or if you have some comments and suggestions, tell me about it just down below. If you didn't like it, no need to tell me about it. Just don't. Stop watching this. Anyway, that would be it for me. It has been a me. A JC. And this has been Look Here Episode 2. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.